it's an honor to welcome you all to the Lifeline Connect Talk series hosted by Deborah Rice Movement. For those of you who are here for the first time, let me take you through the vision, mission and activities of DRM. Deborah Rice Movement is run by a group of godly women who strive to rise up the voice of the voiceless and hope for the hopeless. The motto of Deborah Rice Movement is freely you have received and freely you give. The tagline is from the word of God, which says, arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the God is risen upon you. Isaiah chapter 61 verse one. Coming to the vision of DRM, um, we are here to raise the banner of hope, rescue the abused and raise up as world changers. Uh, all their four functions has a common uh, tag called connect. So the first connect is lifeline connect, where a series of talk, talks on life challenges that are less spoken of in other forms is dealt with. This is clubbed with uh, challenging life stories. This forum is open up for both men and women, irrespective of region, religion and sect. If you wish to be a part of this, register yourself by clicking on the link in our chat section that we will share in some time. The second connect is Helpline Connect. This is run by DRM women who provide prayer and counseling support. Those, call, those who call uh, to this number and need an individual attention, they're escalated to a group of heart-to-heart -heart team where mentors handhold mentees to overcome emotional pain and loss. So feel, feel free to share this helpline number with appropriate uh, people in need. The number is 8801858585. The third connect of DRM is Prayer Connect. It is uh, a prayer for healing and deliverance irrespective of your religion. It happens every Tuesday between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. and it's open to both men and women. Mm -hmm. The fourth connect is the Social Bank Connect. Uh, it is a call to reach out homeless and needy with food provisions and support with a team of uh, women and men from the DRM family. This is about DRM. Moving on to the talk of the day, which is titled Viewing Addiction Through God's Spectacles. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Sister Evangeline Stanley, who is a Christian psychologist. She's tra she trains barefoot counselors and pastors. She's authored the books called Bold and Beautiful based on her 23 years of experience in the counseling arena. She holds an MPhil in psychology and an associate degree in Christian counseling from the UK. She, uh, teaching counseling from the biblical perspective is her strength. Before moving on to uh, listening, listening to her, let us look to God in prayer. I request Sister Vinita Chaka to lead us in prayer. Shall we just bow our heads and commit this time into the hand of the Lord? Heavenly Father, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we just thank you, Father, that we can come to you at all times. And even as we come together to listen and to understand uh, what addiction does to uh, each of us, Lord, we pray that you will open our eyes and open our hearts to understand it from your perspective, Father. And even as uh, we uh, listen, Lord, we pray that it will be something that we, we will truly understand uh, for ourselves and how we can help others. Lord, we pray that even as we listen, we will guard our hearts and uh, know how to approach those with addictions without judgment and uh, understand their struggles in this, in, within this issue. We especially want to uh, commit Sister Evangeline as she uh, leads this session. We pray for your anointing upon her and we pray, Lord, that as she speaks, your words will uh, be you you would be honored and glorified through everything that she uh, she um, talks to us today and so lord we just want to commit this time and 
our sister in your hands and before we ask and pray this in Jesus name. Amen. It's lovely to be here and uh, thank you so much for making me a part of the Deborah Rice. I've always enjoyed being here because this has a group of people who love to learn, who are willing to change, who are willing to learn and who have a heart for people. So the previous uh, talk on addiction and depression, we titled it, titled it as the duality of addiction and depression. And we talked about how there are certain overlaps in addiction and depression. We talked about what depression is. We talked about what addiction is. We talked about the infectivity of addiction and depression, the sobriety, the tolerance, and how people want immediate gratification like children. So they are so immature when people choose this thing of addiction. I assume that people who are listening to me, uh, some of you are counselors, some of you are uh, people who are wanting to help people, who have a desire and a heart for people, and some of you are pastors, some of you are good believers, and some of you are our non-Christian non friends who are yet to know the Lord. And we want to help everybody to overcome this problem. And we are also wanting to help people to help others. That is our aim here. So this evening, I want to introduce the topic today. Our topic today is viewing addictions through the eyes of God. Uh, we all go out in the sun. When we wear yellow glasses, everything looks yellow. When we wear red glasses, everything looks red. So when we wear the glasses and spectacles of God, everything is going to look very different. So this evening, we are going to look at addictions through the eyes of God. Okay, that is our topic for this evening. So for people who do not know the Bible so well, uh, I want to give you an example. When we want to find a friend's house, we go into Google. When we want to find a spelling, we go into Google. When we don't understand something, we go into Google. Like that, we have to have a clear understanding, a clear perspective, and a right perspective on understanding addictions. That is why we have the Bible as our reference point this evening. The Bible is going to be our reference point. The Bible is going to be our textbook because it is a time-proven book. And it is not a new book. It has been inspired and written by men, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we know what the Bible says stands true. Okay. So this evening, as we are going to look at addictions through God's eyes, I want all of us to understand where the word addictions comes from. Where the word alcohol comes from. The root word comes from the word gawala. Gawala which means evil spirit or something which seizes people. It means evil spirit or something which seizes people. Jesus always drew demons. He never wanted this kind of a seizing behavior, a controlling behavior or an evil spirit to take over his children and to take over his people. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 21, we read that we cannot drink of the cup of demons and we cannot drink of the cup of the Lord in the same time. We cannot have a part in the cup of in the table of demons, and we cannot have a part in the table of the Lord at the same time. So what God is trying to say is, this is where you need to make a choice. Do you want to be a part of the devil, or do you want to be a part of uh, me? So we have to make a choice here. So when we help people, we have to help them understand that this is a very serious choice that people have to make. Now, when we go back, travel back to the Old Testament, there were a group of uh, Levites there. They were the leaders of the church. These people were the priests of the church. And they were asked not to take any kind of intoxicating drink or any kind of wine because they had to differentiate between what was godly, what was ungodly, what was clean and what was unclean in the same way we have today's leaders now all of us are leaders at some point if we are a mother we are a leader if we are a dad we are the leader at home and we have team leaders in groups and at some point if we are going to make a decision 
we are going to be leaders and we are going to be people we are going to be leaders who will have people following us when we make wise decisions so as leaders paul is telling us keep away from any kind of addictions keep away from addictions because only when we keep away from addictions only when our mind is sober only when our judgment is clear that is the time when we will not forget the laws of the lord so this evening with this very small and brief introduction i want to present a few principles which are underlying <coughs> excuse me which are underlying in the scriptures which are underlying in the bible these principles may be very familiar to us but we might not have viewed it in the context of addiction so this evening we are going to talk about a few principles 10 of them and then we are going to see how these principles were violated by some of the heroes and heroines of the bible so that god will be brought to the common place when we talk about addiction so the first thing i want to share with you this evening the first principle is that do not be mastered by anything do not be mastered by anything paul is saying here everything is permissible to me but not everything is beneficial to me everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial we read this in first corinthians when he is talking to the leaders and to the church he says don't be enslaved don't be controlled don't be masters or don't be don't allow anybody or any emotion or any behavior or any substance to master you because he says god has given us the holy spirit to control all these behaviors and the temptations to substances so let us not be mastered by anything but we need to be the masters of any kind of a temptation towards addiction that is what we are talking about in this principle don't be mastered by anything it can be food it can be a drink or it can be a behavior which can be addictive now just brushing again what addiction is addiction is something which is repetitive which is habitual which does not regard the consequences and we are not able to control it when people have this kind of a problem then that is called addiction principle 2 is obey the law obey the law now god talks about jesus talks about law to his disciples he says give to caesar what belongs to caesar we need to obey the law he is talking in the context of giving money and paying taxes but when we bring the same verse to our context we need to obey the law because it is wrong to buy it is wrong to possess and it is wrong to condone any kind of a drug that is illegal that is illegal because uh, it can be violence it can be drunken driving or it can be viewing pornographic images of children which are all wrong even when they don't lead to addiction so any kind of drug that is illegal any kind of a uh, drink that is illegal viewing pornographic message images of children all these are not accepted by authority the other thing i want to share with you here in this context is see all of us are under some authority all authority is given to us by god this is what paul tells us this is what he tells to the corinthian church he says all authority is given to us by god so we need to teach our counselors we need to teach our friends who are struggling with addiction that one of the principles that we need to keep in the back of our minds is to obey the law viewing pornographic images having any kind of uh, um, drug that is illegal and our attitude itself should be a submission to authority we are moving on to principle number 3 do not assume that drugs or any addictions can resolve problems or reduce tensions do not assume that drugs or other addictions can resolve problems or reduce tensions now we are seeing this because every time uh, people have an addiction they have a feeling of euphoria they feel very excited they feel very superior they feel up above in the sky but then these addictive behaviors they help people to avoid 
responsible stress management. I'm saying this because I want to dwell on the word called, uh, called, called assume. Do not assume that drugs or other addictions will resolve problems or reduce tensions. Now, what is the assumption here? The assumption is if I have a drug or if I have this kind of a repetitive behavior, I get this kind of a satisfaction. I get, get this kind of a comfort. I get this kind of a release. I get this kind of a gratification. This is a very wrong assumption. Now, there is a principle in counseling which says, when you counsel somebody, we need to first find out what are the negative and wrong assumptions the client believes in. That has to be first challenge, challenged. And then once that is challenged, we need to replace that with the right assumption. See, when the disciples uh, chased away all the devils from Legion, that place was empty. So what happened? More devils came and sat inside Legion. That is what we read. So when false assumptions are challenged, that place should not be left empty. It should be replaced with a positive assumption. That is what we read now. It should be replaced with the right assumptions. So that is principle three. Principle four says, no, sorry, in principle three, when we go back, it also says we need to have responsible stress management. That is very important. I feel stressed. I feel angry. I am grieving. I am upset about something. So I feel if I take a drug or have a drink, I will feel better. But that is not the way we resolve our issues and resolve our stress. We need to really work on our issues, go to the root problems and start from the root level and be responsible in the way we handle our conflicts and stress so that the solutions will be permanent and it will be the scriptural way of resolving our issues. See, the resource, scriptural directive is to bring all our burdens to God, not take our all our burdens to ourselves and try to resolve our problems through drugs. Uh, the fourth principle that we are seeing here is recognize that resistance to temptation is possible. Every time we talk to a client who's going through an addiction, they say, when I see my friends, I give up. When I see that wine shop, I give up. When I see that team of team or that group who sells the drug, I give up. When I see certain images, it really stimulates me and I go into that kind of wrong behavior. So temptation is a very real problem. But then the Bible teaches us, it says the resistance to temptation is possible. How do we do that? We can stay away, we can run away, and we can keep away from all kinds of association of these temptations. We can keep away from situations which can really tempt us. And we can keep away from those friends who lure us into these kind of an addictions. Okay? And the fifth principle that we see on addiction is keep the body pure. Keep the body pure. Now, these are some principles. Some of them are direct. Some of them are underlying. So for our benefit, I have taken all the underlying principles which can apply to addiction this evening. The fifth principle is keep your body pure. Our body is redeemed divinely. Our body is the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in this house. The Holy Spirit lives in this body. This body was divinely created and divinely redeemed. And these needs have to be taken care of by godly methods. When this Holy Spirit is dwelling here, this body cannot become impure by anything that does not glorify God. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. You can read this later on and meditate it later because... When we keep the body pure, we also need to keep it healthy. Every time a drug or a um, repetitive uh, addictive behavior happens in our body, it is not helping our body to be stay healthy. It is causing problems, it is bringing diseases, and it is damaging the hidden organs of our body. So we need to understand that we have been divinely created and we have been divinely possessed by the Holy Spirit and we have been divinely redeemed by the Son who shed his blood for us on the cross and the needs have to be taken care of. The needs of the body have to be taken care of. It can be a need for love. 
it can be a need for acceptance it can be a need for respect it can be a need for comfort these needs have to be taken care of in the healthy biblical way and not by drugs okay and the sixth principle is don't expect to come to god through drugs don't expect to come to god through drugs i have seen people in my experience who say who have told me when i drink i pray better when i go to church when i drink and go to church i worship better sometimes when i drink i feel i am closer to god when i drink i feel all my problems have been resolved when i drink i feel the comfort of god in me when i drink i can understand god better see these are all very wrong assumptions which have to be challenged and these are all very wrong beliefs that people have uh, developed in them and they have learned to believe lies so don't try to come to god through drugs because the bible says we come to god only through the holy spirit the bible says we come to god only through the holy spirit nobody comes to the father except through me these are the words of jesus christ not through drugs not through a brain that is drugged by drugs but we come with clear minds the clarity of mind is very important when we come to god lord i need you in my life lord i need you to cleanse me lord i need you to break me i need you to go into the roots and then change me from the inside out lord but instead if we try to go to god through drugs the reality the clarity of understanding the sin and understanding the dirt that is inside us understanding the need that is inside us is disturbed principle number 7 practice temperance self discipline and self control practice temperance self discipline and self control now this is where we need to say no to ungodliness and say yes to godliness because see i have seen people with the diabetes and with all kinds of problems in their body but they are so used to eating eating and binging and uh, they are also used to gluttony i have seen lot of christian leaders who hoard themselves with food who could keep on eating because it is available this kind of a gluttony this kind of a principle applies directly to spiritual leaders to leaders of the church and to people who uh, get comfort by eating who get comfort by binging it is very important that we say no to gluttony and also no to things i want this i want everything to myself the greed is also a kind of a addiction lust also can be a kind of addiction we talked in the previous episode that sexual behavior if it is going to be repetitive sex also can become an addictive behavior so practice temperance there has to be a self discipline self imposed discipline in the way we eat in the way we say enough to luxury in the way we say no to extravaganza and in the way we deal with lust in our lives and it can also talk about selfish ambition i want to build an empire for myself i want to feel good about myself i want to feel high this is what god is warning us here principle number 8 don't engage in any behavior that might lead others to stumble don't engage in any behavior that might lead others to stumble now this is where we talk about peer pressure here peer pressure is something which is not just for adolescents it is not just for children it follows us even as we are adults it can happen in the family it can happen in our work spot it can happen in churches these are very powerful lures that can pull people towards any kind of an addiction and not keep the body pure now when that happens Paul is warning the believers to not to eat certain things if it is going to be a disturbance for the brother so if our addiction is going to be disturbing somebody even if it's not going to be an addiction like i told you in the beginning paul is saying all things are permissible but not everything is beneficial but if we can have even a little wine if that is going to disturb our brothers and sisters who are baby christians who are just coming to the lord i think we need to be really careful he says refrain from eating 
even if it is going to disturb a friend that is something very important don't engage in any behavior that might make other people not come to christ if that is going to be a stumbling block to somebody and principle number 9 don't get drunk don't get drunk this means have a balance of anything that you have okay paul is telling seems timothy have a little wine man you very weak have a little bit of wine is what he is saying but then he is saying he is talking about abuse don't abuse any substance don't abuse any behavior that's what he is saying so it is clearly condemned drunkenness is clearly condemned in scripture and we should not be in submission to any chemical substance or any addictive behavior the final principle we are going to see this evening is the 10th principle it says do not get drunk but be filled with the spirit be filled with the spirit we read this in ephesians chapter 5 verses 18 it says avoid drunkenness avoid drunkenness but be filled with the holy spirit live a life controlled by the holy spirit see people feel empty inside there is a vacuum inside there is a hole inside something is missing i have friends i have money i have a car i have a house i have everything that the world can give me but still there is something empty inside there is a vacuum inside there is a hole inside which nobody is able to fill so i try to fill it with alcohol i try to fill it with binging i try to fill it with food i try to fill it with drugs sometimes i try to fill it with sex or sometimes i try to fill it with money or even sometimes i fill it try to fill it with caregiving or hard work okay so we need to be really careful here when we talk about these principles i'll just brush through the principles one more time principle number 1 don't be mastered by anything obey the law do not assume that drugs or any other addictions can resolve problems number 4 recognize that resistance to temptation is possible number 5 keep the body pure don't expect to come to god through drugs number 7 practice temperance self discipline and self control don't engage in any behavior that might lead to another to stumble number 9 don't get drunk keep away from abuse number 10 be filled with the holy spirit now we have seen about 10 principles which have been very beautifully taken from the scriptures in the context of addictions for my non christian friends here if you do not understand these principles we are always here to help you the number is on the screen it is available in the group you can always call us for any kind of a help now the second part of my talk today evening is going to be about how certain biblical characters certain biblical heroines and heroes have had a problem with addiction and how some people made a choice not to have any kind of an intoxicating drink or intoxicating behavior the first person who a uh, first place where alcohol and drinking or intoxication is mentioned in the bible is in the story of noah is in the story of noah we see this in genesis now you all know the story of noah now noah he just after he got off shore just after the 40 days and 40 nights of uh, um the flood and the rains just after he came off shore the first thing he did was he planted a vineyard he planted a vineyard and then what he did he got lot of wine and grapes from there and he drank from that vineyard okay now what i understand here from noah's life we all know the story now he drank so much that he lost his sobriety he lost his judgment and he didn't even know that he was lying there naked now that noah had a problem the problem of noah was that he was going through a kind of a guilt and he was also going through a kind of a pressure before and after the flood before and after the flood the guilt was i told the gospel to so many people i told about the flood to so many people my neighbor didn't get into the boat these people did not listen to me 
and they all have been washed off why have so many lives been washed off in water why was god so angry with these people why has there been so much sin in the world and he is really guilty he loved these people so much that he took the guilt upon himself there was also a lot of pressure that came along this is what we call as survivors guilt we call this survivors guilt because he says i he does not say it but he says i escaped my family escaped my sons have escaped the flood my daughter in laws have come in along with me my wife has escaped but so many people have not survived the flood they have not survived the wrath of god so this is what has happened to them they all have gone away from the face of the earth but i have survived why am i holier than them am i better than them am i a worthy of god's grace yes that is the survivor's guilt that he went through and then later on what happens immorality came in his youngest son uh, he saw the nakedness of his father and he took it outside the family he took it to his family he took it to his the two brothers who did not want to see the nakedness of his father you know what we see about noah's addiction in matthew chapter 24 and uh, the verse 36 and 40 to up to 42 he says nobody is going to know the hour when the son of man is going to come even the son of man is not going to know that the angels are not going to know that only the father is going to know that as it was in the days of noah people are going to disappear so the mention is there the days of wickedness which happened during the days of noah has been mentioned here and it's a very very sad story so many times when people have guilt when people have pressure when they are not have able to handle it when they don't have people to talk about it when they do not know how to receive the forgiveness of god to handle that guilt they resort to something which is called self medication they resolve to something which will immediately gratify them which will anesthetize their guilt but that anesthesia is not going to last forever it is going to quickly fade away in a few hours that is what happened to noah okay so that is one lesson that we learn from the life of noah when our friends when we ourselves when people in our family when our adolescent children when clients go through a strong guilt maybe a survivor's guilt or maybe a guilt that they are not able to talk about just let them talk about it help them to resolve that guilt by receiving forgiveness from people who have harmed them people who have hurt them and receive forgiveness from god okay the second aspect which where we see um, addiction here is in the book of esther in the book of esther i will quickly tell you the story and just the highlights there were two festivals in this uh, book that we see the festival of purim and the festival of anuka okay now this is a place this is a festival where drunkenness what was at its highest they drank until they didn't even know the difference between the curse of haman and the blessing of mordecai they kept on drinking the bible says each man was served as much as he was as he wished each man was served while as much as he wished there was absolutely no control now what happened during this festival uh, ahasuerus was the king at this time there was uh, drunk there was drunken drunkenness there was partying they were constantly drinking there was a lot of flaunting of wealth it happened for 180 days and there was also 12 months of beauty treatment which was going on for the women of those uh, of those harem okay this was what was happening now there were two or three problems that was uh, that we need to know today because of the drinking behavior of these people which was happening in the kingdom during this festival one was their thinking was absolutely disturbed and they think their uh, the chiefs the subjects and the king they cared very little for what god thought of them but they cared a lot about what the non jews thought about them their perspective their views what other people understand about them was not give was really disturbed they were not worried about what jehovah god thought about them they gave so much importance to their senses 
they wanted to feel good they wanted to feel elated they wanted to have that euphoria they wanted to be really happy and excited so that is why they dragged it to 180 days why dull our senses we can be excited we can be jolly we can have a lot of fun even without this kind of addictive behaviors these are some things which we need to teach our children and to teach our friends who want to rejoice in a very unhealthy way now we see something here there is something called pride there is vain glory here you know what when this wine was happening this kind of addiction was happening in this festival in the time of ahasuerus the king's judgment i said thinking the king's judgment was also disturbed and that is why he wanted vashti to come in front of all his subjects and entertain all his friends now vashti had a dignity of her own vashti was a woman she did, she did not want to come and uh, show off her beauty to his ministers because she thought only ahasuerus is my wife is my husband why should i show myself to the other men i do not want to do that she was assertive but that dignity was not given by vashti's wife to vashti that and probably ahasuerus knew that vashti is not going to come so he sent sashi he sent seven eunuchs to go and bring her probably he thought somebody had to forcibly bring her this also happened in david when david wanted bachiba to come he sent some men he could have just sent one man but he sent some men so we see here that during this purim and hanuka festivals ahasuerus was drinking he lost his thinking he lost his sober mind he lost his judgment and he lost the way he understood about how viewed god viewed everything and he could not understand how haman was wrong and how mordeka was right okay so they were not able to demark or differentiate between rightness and wrongness this is what we see and now we go on to the third person who we see this evening that is manova's wife i don't know how many of you know manova's wife her name is not mentioned in the scriptures she is an unnamed woman now manova was a man who loved the lord now we read this story in judges chapter 13 she is also mentioned in hebrews chapter 11 you can look at it later on this lady whose name is not even said in the story is not recorded in the scriptures she was barren she was barren she did not have a child but one day an angel of the lord came to her and said i am going to give you a son but you are going to bring him up in one two three four ways one of the ways you need to follow is that even when you are carrying this child you shall not have any wine or any intoxicating drink now the instruction comes to the mother instruction comes to the father it also says it tells us that we as parents need to be role models to our children we as parents need to be role models to our children because even when we are carrying our children in our mother's womb of in the in the in the womb in our womb our feelings our emotions the way we resolve conflicts the way we resolve stress and the way we understand life the way we welcome this baby into the world it is going to very silently but strongly influence the child that is why the angel told manova's wife do not drink wine or do not take any intoxicating drink now the role modeling for children even after manova's child was born now by the way manova's a uh, son was called samson samson is the strongest man of the world strongest man in the world we know today now this is not only for role modeling just in diet and in stress management but she also handled uncertainty very well because the uh, uh, angel of the lord came and spoke to him spoke to manova's wife and she didn't know is this real what is happening god promised that he will give me a child but i don't know when how am i going to bring up this child and another truth that we learn from this uh, parents is that they kept on going back to god lord give us wisdom lord tell us about the vision that you have for this child tell us about the plan that you have for this child how should we bring up this child as parents this evening 
we have a challenge before us. I think Manoa's mom, who has no name, is giving us a huge challenge. We need to tell ourselves everything that I do, everything that I don't do, everything that I drink, the way I resolve my stress, the way I handle my problems, the way I talk to my husband, the way I talk to my wife, everything silently affects my child. My child is absorbing everything like a sponge. Everything is being watched. They kept going back to God. My friends keep asking the Lord for wisdom. Keep asking the Lord for understanding. Keep asking the Lord for daily grace in the way we raise our children. It's not easy because today's world is unkind. Today's world is cruel. Today's world is difficult. Today's world has temptations right in front of our children's eyes. Our children should learn that assertiveness to say no. Our children should have the courage to run away from these kind of temptations. So if this is what we learn from uh, Manoa's wife. And she was a woman who mothered the strongest man in the world. See, barrenness was her problem. Barrenness those days, it carried a stigma. It carried a stigma. How did she handle it? Maybe people around her laughed at her. Maybe people around her questioned her. What is wrong with your body? Why have you still not had a child? Still today, even today, even in cultured homes, the woman is blamed for not being able to conceive. Barrenness is not an easy cross to carry. It is not an easy thorn you have to live with. But then the Lord says, even in spite of barrenness, she did not drink. And she was asked not to drink. She handled it beautifully. She just trusted in the Lord. She kept going back to her spouse and saying, I met this man in the field. I met this man who came and spoke to me that he's going to give me a child. This man who spoke to me told me about how I should bring up this child. He kept going back to his spouse. I think it is also a challenge for us when we as women and as men have issues, when we have problems in life, we need to go to our spouses if they are understanding, if they are emotionally mature, if they are spiritually compatible also, I think it's important that we go and share our issues. Another thing I learned from Manoa's wife was that this angel of the Lord came to see her when she was working in the field. When she was working in the field, see for barren woman, she did not isolate herself. She said, I will go and work. She kept herself occupied. When she kept herself occupied, there was no need for her to anesthetize her stigma or the cross that she was bearing with anything. So she was being very, very wise when she did that. Sarah was also barren. Sarah also received a promise from the Lord that she will be blessed and a huge generation is going to come after her. Manoa's wife was also promised, but look at how Manoa's wife is responding to that promise and look at how Sarah responded to that promise. Okay, it's a lesson that we need to learn here. But then a sad thing is, in spite of this Manoa's mom, Manoa's wife being a very good mom, Samson made bad choices. Samson made selfish choices. He was a rebellious son. But in spite of that, she stood and she obeyed the angel of the Lord by not taking any kind of an intoxicating drink till her, till the end of her life. The second mother that we see here is the mother of John the Baptist, who was also met by an angel and who was also advised, do not drink any intoxicating wine or do not take any strong drink because your child has to be filled with the Holy Spirit even when the child is in the mother's womb, implying that the Holy Spirit and wine, demonic activities and the Holy Spirit cannot live in the same individual. An alcoholic spirit or an addictive spirit and the Spirit of God cannot accord together. That is what we learn from the mother of John the Baptist because it can have a silent influence in our children's life. Okay, and the next uh, character that we see today is in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. This is Hannah's story. Uh, Hannah is a beautiful lady. I've always liked her, but she also carried a stigma. The stigma was barrenness again. And she's sitting in the temple of the Lord and she's praying. She was not loud. She was just 
mumbling among us within herself her lips were moving and there comes eli pastor eli bishop eli comes and he says hey why are you drunk why are you drunk hana why don't you put away your wine he is assuming and hana says no my dear pastor i am not drunk i am praying she had something called loneliness she had something called barrenness she was carrying the cross of stigma but in spite of that she chose not to drink she chose not to drink though people were assuming okay and the next thing that we see is the life of daniel the life of daniel where bible talks about wine and daniel now daniel is making a choice here the bible says daniel determined in his heart that he will not defile himself by wine or any kind of food that is addictive now this gave him inner strength it gave him inner beauty and that spilt on the outside you know he had this no wine lifestyle that is why his mind was sober that is why his judgment was sober he was constantly in touch with god and later on when he was called by belshazzar to interpret the dream for belshazzar he was in a sober mind and he was able to explain that handwriting on the wall that is something we need to decide so if i have any friends who are addicted to it today who are listening to me as we counsel people as you are trying to come out of this addictive behavior it is a choice i am willing to change i am willing to allow the lord to come into my life and to break this pattern of irresponsible stress management irresponsible character management irresponsible conflict management okay sorry so we need to make a choice just like daniel and the next family the next person that i want to talk about today is the story of lot the story of lot lot was made drunk we see this in genesis chapter 19 verse 30 and 38 lot was made drunk now all this while we've been talking about people who were drinking voluntarily who made a choice to drink now we are going to see a few examples about people who were pushed to drink who were forced to drink lot was made to drink made to drink by his own daughters isn't that a sad story his daughters gave him drink and then they had a problem of no hope assumption no hope assumption they thought if we are going to live with our father here in this cave where there are no other men who can sleep with us who can become our husbands and we are going to die like this leaving no lineage we are not going to have any heirs we will have no genealogy after us that was their fear they were not able to trust god they were not able to say lord we are alone here we don't have a man we cannot have husbands can you provide us husbands that is what i call no hope assumptions there are times in our clients lives or in our own lives where we believe there is no hope every door is closed i am now living in a cave situation i now live in a situation where i am isolated i am totally away from the society there is nobody to help me every door is closed so lord i resort to alcohol which is the only remedy i have which is the only comfort i have but then when lot was made to drink his eldest daughter went and slept with him he didn't know when she got up and when she went she did, he didn't even know that the he had slept with his elder daughter the next day they both plan the younger daughter comes and sleep comes and sleeps with him and again he didn't know when she slept and when she got up and went he was playing such a passive role he was so drunk drinking and alcohol or addiction can make us really passive it will remove that assertiveness from our thinking from our perspective from our mental faculties now to understand a little bit about why a lot got into this kind of an addiction this kind of a drunkenness is because number 1 he was afraid to live in the city called zoar because he ran away from that place to save himself and to protect his daughter and his wife so he was afraid the bible says he was afraid to live in zoar and he was living in fear 
so when people are not able to handle fear that also can drive us to addiction i am so scared i am so scared i cannot face society my self esteem is so low i am not able to face my friends i don't feel i can face my future i don't have any confidence i cannot put up with this anymore i'm so scared that fear is so gripping that you are not able to face that fear that's why the bible says i have not given you a spirit of fear but i have given you a spirit of sound mind look at how the bible talks about addiction when we talk about fear the bible talks about sound mind clarity lot 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 that okay he was afraid and then what happens he runs from his play, from his sodom and gomara and then he loses his wife on the way he loses his wife and she becomes a pillar of salt so he is having a problem of grief he is grieving so grieving is also a problem of addicts any kind of a substance abuse or it can be a habitual behavior or it can be an addictive behavior people when they are not able to handle grief they resort to alcohol or some kind of a addiction so my friends as counselors when we are trying to help people when we are trying to help people who are understanding themselves who are understanding their grief who are going through a pain of loss maybe they have lost their father or their mother or a friend or anybody who are very special or precious to them they suddenly feel they don't have a shoulder to lean on they feel a pillar is gone they feel lonely they feel that this kind of a person cannot come into my life again i have lost this person i cannot handle this loneliness so he was grieving over his wife he was not able to cognize at that time that lot's wife disobeyed and turned back and that's how she lost herself he was not able to cognize so he was going through fear he was going through grief and that was unhealthy and the other mistake that he did was he isolated himself from the society he isolated himself from the society he kept himself away he went and went and hid himself in a cave many of us today are hiding ourselves behind something it may be our bank balance it may be the uh, house it may be the kind of car we have it may be the kind of profession we have we are hiding behind something we have built walls around us we are hiding behind some cave and that is isolating us from the society this is a very dangerous place to be in that is when lots of daughters made him really vulnerable proverbs chapter 18 verses 1 says he who separates himself seeks desire that is a dangerous place to be in okay so we need to be careful here so lot was made to drunk the second person who was made to drunk was uria david sent uria to the front line of the war he wanted to have him killed but before that david gave him a little feast david gave uria a chance to sit at his table and eat and drink and he made him drunk because david wanted uria to go back home to betsheba and sleep with him but then god was with uria even when david made him drunk he slept with the servants of david that is what the bible says he slept with the servants of david in a mat and he did not go home god gave him that wisdom at that time to stay there but he gets killed later on this is what you see in the story but then there is also another person who was made to drink absalom made ammon drink in second samuel chapter 13 my friends as christian biblical counselors we need to understand what the scripture teaches exactly about addiction so that is why i am dwelling on this just in this in this series okay so absalom makes ammon drink and kills him because ammon at one point raped absalom's sister who was called tamar he wanted to take vengeance so that also happened in the bible that is what we see and then another interesting thing that we see here is in ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 3 king solomon wise man big man 
and he was a very intelligent man today if we do a psychological iq test for him i think he will be beyond superior very very intelligent he tried making projects he tried women he tried building buildings he tried building gardens he tried everything under the sun he tried intoxicating drinks he tried wine he saw if it was satisfying but it did not we see that in ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 8 finally he says everything is meaningless everything is meaningless is what he says finally okay then we see one more character he is called nabal now nabal we see in first samuel verses 25 he has a problem with his personality he was a person who was miserly he was self sufficient he was a very arrogant person he was his hospitality was very bad he was uh, he has a person with no gratitude and he was resentful of counsel see these are all issues for people who are oriented to psychiatry will know that these are all issues which are associated with a very uh, bad personality issue okay he spoke others degrading he had a lot of foul language and he spoke to david's men without thinking now nabal was had a uh, meaning for his name it was called he was the son of belial he was also called a fool by his people now david and his men kept nabal very well when david asked for some gifts in return nabal was very very arrogant with david's men and david was very angry but then abigail who was nabal's wife was a very wise woman ran to meet david and said my lord do not kill my husband in your anger because my husband is a fool he's got personality issues and she went home saved his life and went home and she found him drinking she found him drinking she did not say anything when she found him drinking she did not say anything she didn't counsel him at that time many of us when our spouses are drunk when our friends are drunk when our counselors are drunk we sit and give them long pieces of advice that will not take them anywhere they will not be able to understand anything when they are under the influence of any kind of an addiction so they need to be sober abigail waited for the morning she waited for the morning and then she spoke to him you know what nabal you've done you have got the king's wrath now you have got david's wrath you've been so bad in your behavior your personality is not pleasing to the lord the way you have developed your character the way you have um, ingrained your uh, stable traits the way you have uh, not imbibed godly characters in you that has really displeased the king so the king wanted to kill you and this is what i've done i've saved your life and nabal was really upset he was really upset and he died in 10 days now we see today that many spouses either the husband or the wife has some uh, an addict husband or sometimes even the wife is an addict with some kind of a bad behavior or a repetitive behavior or an addictive behavior but then the challenge comes when do we talk to them when do we give them help when do we tell them that they need to work on developing and grooming their personalities we cannot become angels overnight we have to start working at them one by one but abigail just because uh, nabal was an alcoholic aban had a drinking behavior she did not leave him she stayed because there was no life threatening situation for her she had her freedom she was a strong woman and she stayed now today we have many modern abigails we have many modern nabals i think we have to empower these abigails to stand for the lord and to rebuild that family okay now there is a time when we need to ask uh, ourselves this this person called belshazzar belshazzar we talked about last week this is the last character i'm going to talk about this evening belshazzar had a dream belshazzar was a person who had a drinking behavior he was drinking and having a feast with all his friends with women and children and all his nobles and he was so drunk that he was losing his judgment 
his thinking his perspectives and he wanted his people to go to the temple of the lord what god see had now he wanted to go to his people to go to the temple of the lord and bring the gold goblets from there which was used in the temple of the lord so that he can drink from them when belshazzar and his friends were drinking they were worshiping and praising the gods of uh, stone and wood and gold and silver see when we when people who are addicts they are not able to cognize they do not know who is sovereign they do not know who is ultimately in control now when this happened the goblets were brought to them the goblets were brought and the tumblers were brought the glasses were brought and he's drinking that is the time when he also loses protection for his country the maids and persians they come around and they take care of her they take hold of babylon and this night belshazzar loses his kingdom he also loses his family he loses his kingship he loses everything but then there is one thing that i want our friends to learn here is that belshazzar some had something called pride belshazzar had something called pride belshazzar's father nebuchadnezzar also had a problem with pride now i want us to understand addiction and pride cannot be friends but usually addiction addiction and pride are friends addiction and humility will be strangers to each other people who are proud people who are addicts they feel everything is under my control i am all powerful i know what i am doing i can resolve my my issues that i takes hold that i takes priority so this is where belchis are also failed and he did not understand that pride was his problem he needed a daniel to come and warn him daniel came and interpreted the handwriting on the wall for him he said you have not humbled yourself if you repent and make yourself humble you will never have to face a handwriting on the wall and if you do that you will save your soul but then he was swayed on the scales and belchazar was found one thing my friends do we have pride inside where is humility in us okay at some point in our lives when we come across people who are proud who do not have this humility they are really vulnerable for an addictive behavior we need to be really careful when we talk about this finally before we end i have a take home message for all of us i have a take home message out of the many characters that we've seen today most of them have been in authority we 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 seen mothers who have been in authority who we we've seen fathers we've seen kings we've seen leaders now god calls us to leadership and we need to be people who are not prone to any kind of an addiction and we also need to be equipped enough to understand people who are struggling with addiction so that we will not damage them by being judgmental by condemning them but by helping them walk out of addiction holding god's hand and gracefully i have a beautiful verse for us here deuteronomy chapter 29 verses 5 and 6 the bible says god himself speaks here he says i have taken you through the wilderness for 40 years i have taken the israelites through the wilderness for 40 years during these 40 years your slippers were not torn your clothes were not torn you did not need bread you did not need wine you did not need wine i did this so that you will know that i am the lord your god awesome i am excited when i am talking this verse i am excited for the bible i am so i am so thankful for the lord for giving us these assurances for giving us these exciting promises because he says i did not give you wine in the wilderness because when you had pain i took care of you when you were legs were paining i took care of you when you wanted non vegetarian i took care of you when you wanted water i took care of you when you were tired 
I took care of you for all these issues. Even when Moses was angry, I took care of you over all these issues. You did not need wine. You did not need an addiction to resolve your problems because I did this so that you will know that I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. My friends, if you are listening to me today with any kind of an addictive behavior, or any, any kind of a substance abuse in your life. It can even be a habit you're not able to break. It can even be a personality trait that you're not able to change. That also can border very closely on addiction. If you are going through this issue, this verse is your answer this evening. The Lord will take care of you if we give ourselves into his hands. We just have to tell him like a little child. Lord, I am not able to come out of this. Lord, I am not able to handle myself. Lord, I am not able to walk myself out of this addiction. Will you hold my hand this evening? Will you help me, Lord, to come out of this addiction so that I will be strengthened, so that you will give me a sound mind, so that you will give me clarity, that you will give me responsible and healthy biblical ways of handling my problems. Addiction is not the answer. Thank you, friends, for listening. If you have any questions, you can always ask. Thank you, Sister Evangeline, for that thought-provoking session uh, based out of the Bible. It was so. It was. Uh, I hope it will be useful for all the participants. We can close the session with prayer by Sister Jishya. Father God, uh, Father God, we thank you for this nice time, Lord. Father, we believe you were here listening to the entire conversation, listening to everything, Master. We, there are things that we are not able to share it out, Lord. There are things that we are not able to tell out. We tell out that we are counselors, but there are times when we go through sorts of addiction. We are not able to handle our mood swings. We aren't able to deal with things, Father God. And there are times when we feel broken and vulnerable, Father. Thank you so much for giving us a word of encouragement, telling us that you will take care of us, Master, if we would surrender. Jesus, we just want to take this minute to surrender ourselves, our emotions, our feelings, all of that into your hands, Father. Father, thank you so much for precious souls that were listening to the sermon today that was that was participating in the Zoom call, Father. Jesus, we had so all of them had so many priorities, but they wanted to learn, Father. And you are you you have told that you will show a distinction between people who serve you and who do not serve you. And we pray that each of them would personally experience that distinction in their lives, though it's pandemic or whatever might be around us. We just pray for your distinction, Master. Let this be a season of harvest for all of us, Father God. And we pray as we minister to people as we counsel them, as we uh, talk to people, we pray that your Holy Spirit would inspire us to and put the right word to talk to them, Father God. Let our hearts not be troubled. And we also know that you're so close to the crushed and broken in the spirit, Father. Whoever here who are crushed, who's broken in the spirit, you're just embracing them. And we pray that they would feel the warmth of your touch tonight, Master. We pray that they would experience it, Father God. Jesus, you love each of us so much, Master. You, you, we are special to you, Father. And you love us the way you are. And you handpicked us to do your task, Father. And Father, we want to pray for people who are into addiction, Lord. Jesus, uh, there were times that we've been uh, judgmental. We've thought like, the wrong things about them. We've thought bad things about them. We've gossiped about them. We just want to ask you sorry for all those things that we've done and we just want to be an instrument where we will be a blessing to them, Master. We read in the Bible when the sun sets them free, they are free forever, Master. And we speak those words of freedom over their lives and no more addiction, whatever addiction they're going through. We just pray that you would instill our hearts and you would talk to us personally, whisper to us and lead us the right time to talk to them and the right way to communicate with them and handle their master. Uh, give us compassion towards them. And uh, if you were here on this earth, how you would have handled them. Give us that heart 
so that we would express your love and your compassion and may our lives speak volumes than our words father god and father whoever have attended today i pray that you would bless them we bless them from the bottom of our hearts we pray that you would grant the desires of their hearts and father i pray uh whatever breakthrough they've been anticipating they've been waiting and all of us father we are sailing on the same boat jesus and thank you so much uh, we can smile at the storm we can smile no matter what because we know you are our anchor master and we personally commit all of them into your hands thank you for this fellowship and thank you for evangelina ka thank you for the word that she brought to us master we bless her father and bless the works of her hand father may she continue to be a blessing to thousands and millions in the days to come and we bless this ministry out also father god uh, we pray from the bottom of our hearts that you would grant the desires of their hearts and all of them who participated we speak your peace to surround us to engulf us and to rule our hearts that surpasses all our understanding master in jesus name i pray amen amen so i hope all of you understand that this is a series that we are doing the last week we did on the duality of depression and addictions and this week we have done on viewing addiction through the eyes of god in the next week we will do on viewing uh, addiction depression through god's eyes so like that we have different weeks which are going to be a series of study on addiction and depression so i also i want all of you to journey with us so that you will feel complete about understanding addiction and depression together yeah i think there's a question uh, rebecca priya yes. uh, you can go ahead with your question like you can unmute yourself and ask your question sister rebecca priya Oh, I'm not sure why she's put her uh, hand up. I think she's just saying hi. Probably, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> a, a wonderful session. Very nice. Um, God's perspective of addiction, alcoholic addiction. Um, <clears throat> but generally, people, uh, secular uh, psychiatric doctors, say that addiction is a disease that has to yes. be treated. Yes. And, uh, uh, how do you view it? Yeah, addiction is definitely a disease. Uh, it uh, it leads to a disease. See, it 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 is like this. Uh, when children are not taught by parents in homes on how to resolve conflicts, on how to handle grief, on how to handle guilt, on how to manage stress, <coughs> and these issues are not handled and addressed at home, when children have <clears throat> wrong role models at home children think oh my when my parents have a conflict my dad bangs the door and runs to the alcohol and he has a drink and he comes back and he quietly sleeps so maybe this is how i need to handle my problem so children learn more by watching rather than our advices so these children grow into adolescence and then they start slowly understanding that addiction is one conflict resolution style which is very wrong and then they go into adults and then they have stresses in their marriage and it stays on with them <coughs> as adults so every time there is a substance that is ingested into their body it starts affecting the brain okay because there is a chemical uh, problem that happens in the brain and that is why psychiatrists call it a disease because once the addiction starts happening they have to go through a phase called detoxification this is removal of all the unnecessary fatty acids and unnecessary alcohol all the sediments that is in the brain so they have to give you some medication to remove all the <clears throat> damage that the chemicals is caused to your brain so that is why they call it an illness it is definitely an illness we need medical intervention once it becomes an addiction but along with medical intervention i also believe there is something called psychotherapy or intensive counseling which will ultimately help the uh, client 
now this is we cannot have medication for life uh, we cannot be dependent on drugs otherwise we will become drug dependent so with psychotherapy or with christian counseling or christian psychotherapy the addict has to go through all the issues that pushed him into addiction and resolve those issues one by one like we talked in the principles earlier all the wrong assumptions and negative assumptions has to be surfaced they have to be identified then they have to be challenged and they have to be replaced with the positive beliefs and positive assumptions okay so when this happens there is a lot of rehabilitation and healing that goes on inside the person along with a lot of prayer i hope you understand uh, pollen yes yes have i answered your question yes. yeah you exactly. have answered. Yeah. Yes. All these are possible. Only they come willingly for the counseling, right? Exactly. Exactly. They cannot be See, compelled you, to. Yeah, you cannot drag them into something, but then there is also a time when you have to drag them that uh, help is possible. Some oh. people, I mean, my counseling experience, I have seen when adolescents are brought by their parents, the first session there has to be a push. but once they are comfortable with the counselor then they keep coming so initially a gentle push and gentle nudge has to be there that helps evangela ka there's another question sometimes yeah. addiction ends up with <laughs> doubting the salvation so how do you see it and could you share a word about that addiction will not uh, remove salvation but the person has to come back to god to enjoy salvation addiction and salvation cannot go together like for example a person who has accepted the lord as his personal savior and has uh, received the forgiveness of sins and has enjoyed the assurance of salvation enjoyed the assurance of eternal life that person is uh, continuing his spiritual life but then at one point he has a major stressor in his life may be in his family or in his work spot and he resorts to addiction we call that sliding back or a backsliding experience he will not lose his salvation but he has to come back to god at some point that is what i would like to say but then if he is wantonly uh, says i have tried christ and it's not working and i am going to drink or i am going to get into this addictive behavior because that is what that's the kind of comfort i want if that wanton choice is made i think god will be the judge i do not want to say anything on this because the bible does not tell us that he will be condemned because judgment belongs to the lord we have to wait for the day of judgment whether that person is going to uh, go to heaven or lose salvation but i always believe a person once saved he saved forever but if he wantonly denies christ then that's a choice he has to make the question is uh, nowadays it's becoming a lifestyle to drink and you know it's becoming a lifestyle uh, to see pornography and all that stuff yes. they don't see it a big yes. deal it's just part and parcel of a life so yes. don't see it as an addiction problem yes so people go out with their friends and they go out and drink as family they drink as a get together they drink if there's a occasion they drink and i mean when it comes to pornography also they share it among their friends now how do we handle it as a problem i mean maybe your colleagues yes. friends see yeah. that yes i understand what you're saying thank you for your question sister see when we look at old testament and in the new testament drinking was a social behavior people drank in the old testament and in the new testament that's why paul is talking so much about drunkenness and he is saying a little wine is good for your body he is not talking about drinking but then today what starts as a social behavior what starts as a social drinking pattern it slowly becomes abuse slowly becomes a substance abuse so i personally i would suggest even a social drinking behavior has to be condoned has to be um, taught to our children that that is not acceptable see you cannot go to a club and have lime juice there you cannot do that you cannot be having fire on your lap and saying it cannot burn me it will not burn me so we have to make certain very very strong clear 
boundary choices i will not choose friends who will take me to a pub i will not choose friends who have social drinking as an acceptable behavior i will stay well within the boundaries and when you talk about pornography pornography is absolutely sin and that is illegal that breaks the law so we know that is addictive to the mind every time a child or an adolescent or a person views a pornographic image there are a lot of pleasure chemicals that get released in your brain okay now when that happens the person becomes addicted to those pleasure chemicals they want those chemicals to keep secreting again and again so that becomes a repetitive habitual behavior regardless of consequences bringing back the definition of addiction then they feel uh, i want this uh, if i don't watch this i cannot have sex with my wife now i am counseling lot of families today where the wife says unless my husband watches triple x movies or badly rated movies he does not sleep with me and he sleeps with me and he wants me to do things that are uh, being portrayed in pornography so that loses love that becomes lustful so we need to draw a very clear line and a boundary between what our children watch and we can always lock their apps there is something called parental control till the child is about uh, mature enough to say no to these things we have to protect them god protects them from temptations but parents need to protect children from tempting environments i think that is our responsibility as parents so even in our family prayers we can make this as a topic of discussion what is pornography why should we stay out of it what is addiction so these days in churches we talk about faith and fasting and prayer and tithes and offerings and praise and worship these are all issues which are so down to earth our children are suffering in silence with addictions why is our church not addressing that i think that is why our children are suffering even in our earth uh, youth groups and in our sunday schools children have to be taught what to watch what not to watch what kind of friends to choose who to hang around with what kind of books to read how to use the mobile and uh, parents have to really um, uh, ration their time screen time and give mobile to their children only with supervision i think that is how we can start uh, um, stopping it from the root level once they become adults then they become responsible for their actions but we need to be careful how children are taught what they are taught i got one last question uh, i mean if somebody is wants yes. to addiction i mean is there a person that we can refer to or any organization because we just come across all secular organization uh, i mean yes. anonymous alcohol anonymous or something like that but uh, is there any yeah. christian no uh, um sorry. i'm sorry the church has not uh, been so active and our uh, um, the christian community has not started a, a home for uh, addicts as such as of i know but then chennai ttk is very good christian medical college hospital in velour is very good nimans is very good and kalyani also they say is very good but after the detoxification and after what the doctors can do to help addicts after the medical intervention is done then we can go in for christian psychotherapy and you can refer patients to me and you can refer to refer patients to other psychiatrists in the group 